how to drive traffic to your website, how to really convert that sales. The last part is really how do you, you know, take that lipstick or you know, computer or TV from that website and bring it all the way to your home. And um, for the last panel today, we're going to be focusing on logistics and fulfillment. Um, we're going to have a panel um, that's going to be moderated by Mitch Berman, who's Group Chief Logistic Officer of e-commerce, along with three uh, experts within this field. So Bertrand Perat, CEO of Lazada Thailand, is going to be giving a brief presentation. And then the panel will be joined by Alex Ng, Director and General Manager of Care Express Thailand, and Santit Jirawong Graysan, Co-Founder and Managing Director of La La Move Thailand. So please welcome the panel. Santit. Okay. Okay, so I will stand up a bit. Good afternoon. Uh, very pleased to meet you all and to do and to speak about logistics, right? Because when we speak about e-commerce, marketing, website, getting the customer, getting the orders, what makes sense at the end in order to make money is to be able to make the deliveries to the customer. And this is where the, the off part starts. Uh, my name is Bertrand. I'm the Chief Operation Officer for Lazada Thailand. Um, I've been working for Lazada for one year now. Before that, I was working for Amazon in France, where I used to manage the uh, supply chain for France and then Italy and Spain on top. Uh, <coughs> and then I moved to Lazada afterwards. So just let me give you a bit of ideas. Maybe it's you first, no? I think it's you first. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> OK, thanks, Patron. Um, <laughs> it was a good one. So uh, my name is Mitch. I'm very excited to be here today to meet all of you. I'm not getting out of the warehouse too often. So um, I'm really excited to meet all of you here. In the last 20 years, I was um, optimizing the supply chain for companies such as Microsoft for Apple within Asia, in Europe, in the US as well. And only six months ago, I basically joined um, e-commerce as a chief logistics officer, mainly focusing on all the warehousing, what we have, all the transportation, and finding my way through. So I'm fairly new, I would say, to this whole um, e-commerce thing, what everyone talks about. Am I still there? Yeah. No, I have one. Oh, I thought my voice. Okay, fine. So, um, where was I? Yeah, right. So, um, the next thing what I was thinking about is like, I come from a B2B world, so that really means my world was really pallets, was huge warehousing distribution centers. Why is that so relevant, what I did before? Because by the end of the day, what we are going through here now with e-commerce is similar to what the B2B world went through like 15, 20 years ago. So um, there was also the question is like, how do you scale? How do you set up your networks? How do you put up distribution markets? Where do you want to distribute? What are the strategic locations? All these things basically um, I learned a couple of years back and the, um, there are many parallels. What I see to what we have in the e-commerce world, the only difference what you have today here is we don't have that much time. Yeah? In the B2B world, it was really developing over a couple of years, but when I see that here, how quickly we ramp up warehouses, and I will, um, um, uh, the other um, panel speakers will also speak to that, but it's just very impressive if you see in terms of um, crows how quickly it goes. And this is even something which is new for me from a B2B world. So what am I going to show you today? Um, I want to show you the three stages of maturity. This is based on my experience. You basically have the startup phase where you're just a small, let it be a brand, you just have a product and you want to start in a market. The numbers which I put up there are debatable. Up to you guys to, to judge by the end of the day whether you see yourself in certain areas. But startup for me, it's more like you have something, you try it out, you bring it into the market. You'll go to the next phase, which I call the smart up phase. You won't believe, but many people who are coming to us and want us to run their supply chain, they don't really know. What is supply chain? What does that mean? What are KPIs in a warehouse? How do you pick? How do you ship? All this kind, what is a WMS system? All of it, they don't know. And that's what I'm um, explaining in the smart up. And then finally, we go, or some companies go really to a scale up. Scale up, I think you have some very good examples which we heard already today. You see here um, one picture, if that works here, is um, obviously from uh, Matahari Mall 
who are actually, they scaled up. I mean, they are at a level where you say, you know what, you cannot just sit somewhere in a corner and just operate it. So, going into this um, startup phase, what we typically, what we typically see from a, character, um, from a characteristics perspective is it's very low volumes for the start, right? It is difficult to project and it's very manual. The possible challenges, what you have is limited budget. Either you are um, funded by EVC or you have a, a certain budget as a brand for the, uh, the e-commerce channel. And um, the other one would be you have limited focus because you just want to get your product out. You don't care so much about how you do it. You just want to get it out, right? So my advice would be in this case really keep it simple. Don't over invest. If you can, do it in-house. If you really outsource it, go to someone who can um, have shared operations for you. Just looking at potential initiatives, and it doesn't mean you have to, have to, to try all of them by, by any means, but uh, one thing what I think is, is quite interesting, and uh, Paul said that right at the opening session, was about in-store fulfillment, which means basically you don't need to have the physical product in your, um, in your warehouse, but it could be you have it available on your web store. The people know when they order online, aha, I have it in store in, let's say, somewhere in, in, in Bangna, and someone picks it up from our site because it's available and delivers it to the end customer. What's the biggest advantage by the end of the day is you have a way higher inventory, even you don't have it physically at your place, and you're not running out of um, all the stock all the time. Another one which I think is, is quite interesting is also when you look at what we are doing with, um, uh, with DKSH right now, is um, where we utilize their B2B, a big center, and we're just getting a small corner. That means you don't need to allocate, you don't need to have extra stock somewhere else. We can do that within the warehouse of your 3PL of yourself and run it from our side. Yeah? Very important to save costs at the start. Um, going to SmartUp. SmartUp is a very crucial phase to learn the ropes, to really understand what this is, out of, uh, what this is all about. Concentrate on scaling. Your volume uh, picks up. You have um, uh, moderate to high volumes, you have a high MOM growth, right? And you also see certain spikes, which might be driven by marketing or whatever it is. Um, what you will also face during that time is you have very high costs per order because you're not looking really into how can I um, optimize um, stuff in the warehouse, how do I do cheaper picking and getting the stuff out in general, and also scaling, yeah? Because the volumes, they go like this, and out of a sudden, you cannot go back to your client and say, normally it takes a day, but now you have to wait two weeks for the order because then they will not come again. So. Potential initiatives, and again, I'm not saying you need to follow all of it, but um, one thing is, I just want to point out, enable growth, yeah? Lots of people only saying, hey, let's put up a big warehouse, everything's gonna be fine. It's not that simple. You have to think about people, yeah? People who understand, but not only um, your, your service provider, your outsourced um, 3PL or whatever, needs to have good people, but also from your side, yeah? You need someone to understand what the supply chain is and what's driving the costs. The other thing is um, also systems. It's a difference whether you, um, oper whether you process just like 20 orders a day or whether you do like 10,000s. You will see if you have a homegrown system and not a state-of-the-art WMS, it will break down. Um, another part which I think is very crucial is understand what are your cost drivers, yeah? If you have a warehouse, it could be your picking process which is very manual, it could be your warehouse is in a shitty location, it's not scalable, whatever it is, but you need to look into the different cost buckets and rather look at everything, look at the bigger picture, and then you can go back and say, like, what are the initiatives which I can drive to bring down my logistics cost? Am I too fast? Oh, no. So, um, next one, scale up. Scale up, not many companies go to such a scale, but um, it is very interesting. Obviously, you really have achieved the high volumes. You have um, mostly stagnating costs. You have like a dedicated warehouse. You have operations, which are more or less dedicated to, um, to, your, um, uh, to the whole setup and you continue to have space constraints. Just by the nature of the business, you ship more, you need to have more inventory on hand. What do you need to do in this case is really build a sustainable, uh, a sustainable distribution model. How can you do that? So basically, look at your warehouse as a whole. You can drive automation, and I know in the B2B world, it's very common to do automation. You don't see that much in the B2C world yet. Everyone says it costs me like half a million, a million US dollar, but if you really scale up, and even labor is still cheap within the ASEAN countries, but you will still see if you have 300 people doing picking, packing, and shipping, if you put some, and whether it's conveyor belts, whether it's someone as sophisticated as voice picking, or whether you even have complete robots, it needs to make sense, but you have to calculate it before. 
Another one is um, establish, um, establish hub and spoke services. So um, just an example, what we're doing right now in, in Indonesia, we have a big issue in terms of 3PLs, getting all our volumes, which is quite scalable, to get it all over Indonesia. There is not one single 3PL who can actually do COD everywhere and fulfill the SLAs. So what did we do by the end of the day? We were setting up um, hubs just last week. We started with Bandung as well as with Surabaya, and we are basically putting everything into a truck overnight. We line haul it over there. We have motorbike drivers, just a small setup over there, and we do the final mile ourselves. What's the selling point for my client? Because I can't go back and say, you know what, guys? Sorry, but the carrier screwed up because I'm managing the carrier. So we get the COD money quicker back. We're talking about three to four weeks, what they normally have to wait. And the other thing is the SLA will improve. Yeah? So just to, give an up, uh, just to give you an example of one of the customers which I, am, uh, which I took over in Indonesia. So we basically started with, um, if you just look at it, they started within one year, they went from startup to smart up to scale up within one year, just by the sheer volume what they were driving. That also means like coming back to the B2B comparison, it goes much quicker, right? So one thing what you have to keep in mind when you do that, so first of all, it's fashion stuff, manufacturing to consumer client. It went through all the phases, what I mentioned. It grew from 24 orders to 6,600 orders per day. And that's what we're doing today. If you go further up towards June, you see it's peaking even more. We're talking about um, 12,000, 15,000 orders a month. So what did we do in order to accommodate it? So we basically took on the business. We um, increased the carriers because no one could um, de deliver all the, the markets which we needed. We increased the racking by 100%. People were choking that I'm even trying to set up racks now in the toilet because we're literally running out of space in the warehouse. Um, evaluation of new warehouse, so at some stage it's just that's all you can do. There is not much more. We're talking about 3,000, one of our um, uh, warehouses which we have. So we said we need a new one. So we went out, we looked at one. We switched to 24 by 7 operations already in November to just manage the volume. And um, at the moment we do off-site storage. We're even getting containers which we store um, outside of the warehouse just to make sure we can um, uh, cope with the volume. Until the warehouse is set up, which will be in June, but we can't wait until then and say, sorry, but you cannot give us more inventory, right? So um, this is just some impressions. So that's the, the new um, uh, setup in Chawang. It's 6,900 square meters. It used to be a carpet manufacturer. And what we need to do is, so 6,900, we need to elevate the roof to 12 meter. We're setting up four level mezzanine floors. We have 10 inbound, 20 outbound stations. I don't want to bore you with all the, um, the specifics, but um, we really set it up in a way which gives them the ability to grow, not only until the end of the year. Again, look at the bigger picture that you have two or three years ahead and you can operate it. Um, how did we do it? That's lots of questions what we're getting right now. Is so we were obviously looking into time studies. How long do you need to, t to do a pick? How much is it for um, processing the order, packing it and all that? So we put all that information, space calculation, how much do we store? What's the best way of storing it? We um, used AutoCAD for layout planning, obviously. We used the tender management tool. We are buying fairly an amount of racks of equipment and all of it. So we want to make sure we, we not only have one alternative, but we have several. And also we did a location analysis because most of our customers require like next day delivery, in some cases even same day, so we need to have a, a proper location. So um, there we came up then with a short and long-term business plan for the client. We um, ramped up the workforce just to give you numbers. We started with three people when we take on that business. We are now at 113 and we will be 275. Yeah? So that's very interesting if you just think about it, um, how quickly that ramps and if you as a customer if the discussion starts about do you want to do it in-house or outsourced, before you in-house it, think about what's the scale of what you're taking over. And I hear a lot from clients are saying like, you know what, doesn't matter, I just hired this very cool supply chain guy, he's really knowledgeable. Yes, but you're not hiring an organization. You're hiring one individual, expect him to run everything what we build up now over a while. So I'm okay with taking it back, but think of it in a stepped approach, do the right measurements in between, and then you can take it on, if that's what you require. So, last one. Um, I think I'm good in time, actually. So, um, if I just look at it, so I was um, crunching some numbers, looking what we, um, what we have in terms of current customer base, and in January 2015, 
If I just use the three uh, brackets, what we have with less than a thousand, with a thousand to a hundred, and a hundred thousand plus, as of January last year, we were basically 92% of our customers were really what we consider as startups, just from a, from a volume perspective. 8% were in the smart up phase, so they were learning the ropes. And um, our customer base as of January, just this year, when we measured it again, it is 74% only still fall into that bucket. Now you can always say some of them maybe discontinued, but the interesting part is really 21%, that means one-fifth of our customers now are actually above 1,000 orders and they're looking into the scaling piece. And what's even more impressive is that we have a couple of customers who even managed to scale up to such a high volume that you, um, they need to have a sophisticated and a sustainable supply chain. What you see as well is here, is, um, especially within the startup phase, I looked at the volume, so 16%, uh, 16 times their, um, uh, their shipments which they had from start of the year until the end of the year. It's just 16 times of the same volume. If you go into a um, smart up phase, you're talking about three times, but even if you're in a scale up, sorry, if you're in a scale up, you're still talking about um, two times the volume, yeah? Which is quite impressive and that leads back to me, I mean, as you can see, the market is really growing exponentially and whether you own your own warehouse, whether you run the logistics via 3PL, but the most important part is to ask yourself the question, are you ready for doing it? Yeah? And have you considered everything? And I think it's all about, if I just look at the customer, what we have in Indonesia, it's a lot about trust. And even we are in, in a way your, um, uh, your supplier, or your, whatever you call it, 3PL, um, outsource service provider, it doesn't matter but it's all about trust and whether you have the feeling that person can bring you there. Okay? That's for my part. Thanks. Okay, this time it's really me. <clears throat> Um, so we're discussing about uh, outsourcing and one of the question is in-house versus uh, outsource. And is, is really building in-house makes really sense or not? And is it really an antagonism versus what is uh, outsource? So let's take a few examples that, that exist and which are in the news. Amazon just announced recently that they were building their full global logistics company as well, trying to challenge as well a bit Alibaba with their Chao Niao, uh, company they have built. Uh, in the same time, when I was working at Amazon, we were doing our own fulfillment. We were offering uh, fulfillment by Amazon to sellers. But at the same time, Amazon was starting outsourcing part of its fulfillment. Not on the media, DVDs, um, books they are doing, which is the fast moving items, but on part of their volume, which were the fridge, the big white goods, which are very difficult to handle. So why are, we do, why are they doing that? What is the benefit in it? The, one of the answers is just that you have to focus on your core business and their core business, which is expedite very fast products and where it makes sense economically. When you've got a fridge and a book ordered together, you're going to send two different parcels. One with one big truck, one big 3PL, to make a home delivery with an appointment to get the fridge delivered. The other one is going to be with, in France, La Poste, Royal Mail, or here we're going with uh, Kerry, Lex, e-commerce, whoever, right? But basically, what will happen is different parcels. If you start to have two books together for the same customer, you're able to put them in the same parcels, and then you're saving a lot on your logistical cost. So the, the idea of Amazon was there to start to also part of their business, which is not disoptimizing their full chain, because it's a lot of optimization that you want to do not, but as well is where they can be smarter and they can find somebody be able to do it better for them at a cheaper cost overall because the big warehouses may not be designed to handle big, big parcels. When you start to put conveyors in the warehouse, you cannot put a fridge on it, right? It's not, it's the, fr the conveyor is going to break down. So it's just a matter of how do you adapt your supply chain to be able to meet your needs and your growth. The, the other part as well on the in-house versus outsource is um, transportation part as well, which is a question is, do we do it ourselves? Do we do it ourselves everywhere? Or do we handle it, outsource it to some people? Taking again the example of Amazon. As you know, Amazon has started their own 3PL company in a lot of countries. In the uh, UK, they have built this Amazon uh, uh, MZDL uh, company. In France, they have invested in uh, Colis Privé as well, which is, a, which is a delivery company. And why are they do doing that? It's, it's not 
is not because others cannot do as good as they can, right? But it's as well in terms of the market overall. Amazon, in December this year in the US, they have just blocked the full delivery market of DHL, uh, of um, UPS and FedEx. Nobody could send parcel anymore, and it was difficult to make all the deliveries because they were just a so massive bump of volume for the Christmas period. So as well in the markets, you have to be careful that if you outsource or if you want to do insource, it's a way to protect your customer experience at the end. You don't want to block, to be blocked by, because a lap pause, a French lap pause cannot accept your volume, or the Royal Mail in UK cannot accept your volume, or that FedEx and, and UPS just don't take your parcels. Customers have placed the order, you want to make the deliveries. So these are as well the rationale behind making some time in-house, just to be able to, to protect. So two main learnings, right? So one is, is the activity part of your core business? And are you good at it as well? Because you want to have a good customer experience. So if it's your core business, you're not good at it, maybe it's better you start to outsource and to give to somebody who is good at it and you partner with him. At some point, you can learn from him and try to develop. But if you want your business to grow, you may want to be good at it. Otherwise, customer may not come back. And as well, is it a key risk to your, to your success, right? So Amazon on the transportation side is exactly that. If they cannot make the deliveries, it's, it's not going to work. If you got a panel of 3PLs, like in Indonesia, which are, you are not able to have a full 3PL being able to handle everything, you need to have a way to give parcel to one person to another person. Or if you want to protect the customer experience because you know some 3PLs are good in some region in Thailand, some of them are, 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 are better in others, then you want to have the ability in-house to be able to split your volume between different 3PLs and play on that. You optimize your cost, and as well, you optimize your, uh, and you improve your customer experience. So three main questions to ask to yourself if you want to go in-house or outsource. One is current business and current size. Based on what Mish says, the size matter and the evolution of it matters a lot. Moving from one warehouse to another warehouse is not, is far, far more complex than even moving from one office to another office. And we all know that changing offices can be complex as well. Because instead of moving people, you have to move goods, you have to move equipment, shelvings. Uh, it put disruption in your business as well. So you have to think as well long term. And are you ready to invest in the long term and to trust it to, put, to, to be able to go there? And as well is versus your existing business, do you have some synergies existing? Uh, some of the shops we are having or some of the pictures you were showing, we are having shops uh, or were sellers or having shop in shop, right? They're, they've got their full fill in their own shop directly. They've got their brick and mortar customer coming in the shop saying, hello, I want this one, plus they go on their computer and they fulfill on their side. So this one is kind of synergies they can do. Bigger ones, which are importing product, they are doing B2B in the same warehouse, they are doing B2C on, uh, based on the orders they receive from, from Lazada. And this one as well, they are able to, to handle this differentiation and not to, to increase the space or to build new warehouse to be able to do it. The, uh, the second question is, do you have the expertise to launch it internally? And this one comes to the uh, bottom line, which is be careful, e-commerce is not standard retail business. This one is something important you have to, to understand if you want to go really in-house, especially on the fulfillment part, or even on the delivery part on the on e-commerce. The e when you want to make e-commerce, the customer do not go to the shelf in your shop, in your warehouse to pick the product. The customer may not be at home to receive the product. He's not coming to your place. So you have different things, different uh, issues you have to solve in the process. Then when you get an order on your screen that it is going to be um, this uh, iPhone um, cover case, you have to make sure that the one you've got on the shelf in your warehouse is exactly the same one. You need to start to tag all your items, which you don't do in the normal brick and mortar uh, so, um, retail, right? When you go to a supermarket, you go to 7-Eleven, Tesco, Big C, or wherever, the products are not necessarily tagged uniquely, right? The customers see it, take one, and that's fine, and he's happy about it. In e-commerce, it's very different. They don't see the product. You have to make sure you pick exactly the right one. You have to know exactly where it is as well, because if you promise it on the website, you have to make sure you've got it on stock. Otherwise, you will have to cancel the order, and the customer is going to be pissed off. At the end, this one, if you want to know where it is, you have to invest in the technology so that you have to know exactly on which shelf, in which location, in which bins, which item do you have. So then you're ensuring a high inventory accuracy. And the standard in the um, e-commerce for the inventory accuracy is 99.99%. You want to be for every SKU to, to know it every, um, exactly where it is in your warehouse, to be able to pick it on time. 
You want as well to be able to track it during the, way, during the fulfillment in your warehouse. You want to know on which cart it is. Because then at some point, if you know you're going to be late for the cutoff time, you, have to, you can go to the right guy, to the right picker, to push it to make the deliveries to you. So it's a lot of expertise, a lot of technology where you have to, to be able to invest on, and which is very different than normal business that you can do. So that's one, the last one is, are you ready to invest? Because it's investment. Investments in warehouses, in renting, in location. Sometimes you want to take a bit more long term as well, because um, uh, warehouse owners may want more like uh, two years, three years, four years, and, uh, than only six months, or, or then you start to pay a premium on it. Um, the other part as well is investing as well on technology and building your tools, or then you purchase tools on the market, but still you may want to have it a bit customized, adapted, be able to print your own uh, shipping labels, to put your own invoices, etc. So still it's investment in time as well and training of the people. Uh, which which are um, question you have to consider, which are as well based on the long term view, are you okay to, to develop it for more, right? Because if you've got a size that we're saying the growth like times 15 per, thousand, times 16 percent, it's not the same job you're doing at the end of the beginning of the year and at the end of the year. So all that part is additional cost to invest and where do you open your next warehouses and all the questions you have to answer. <coughs> so I was starting to put a bit some numbers to give you a bit what different model exists, what I can have seen in the industry. Uh, the size are in order per day, not order per month, but actually it's kind of similar what we put together. And different type of fulfillment and distribution as well. What do you want to do? You, we start with small sellers, which are just starting, like zero to 10 orders a day. It's not that big. Uh, then this one for sure, local fulfillment is the best way. You don't want to invest in a lot of stock. You, you get the product at home. You can fulfill it by yourself. And then you can easily go to a post office or wherever to be able to drop off, to drop off your item. You're independent. It's small volume. That's fine. The issue is there is no benefit at all of scale, right? You go only to one point to deposit the parcels. No, no scale effect there. Uh, your fulfillment, you do it at home, etc. That there is no gain for you. Second one is 10 parcel to 100 parcel. This one, you start to have a bit more volume, right? You sometimes during the peak season, you may want to have a one time to help you, or some of the shops we are sellers we are seeing are having friends or family coming in and helping them to pack during the big campaigns. You do see your, full, uh, your, your fulfillment, but 100 parcel to give to typos starts to be a bit difficult, right? So then after all, you're moving more to a pickup scenario where you've got a 3PL coming at your home and picking up the items for you and then handling the deliveries afterwards. Uh, you, you're able to get, depending on who is doing it and what is the capacity they have, maybe some transportation optimization because they could be kind of a broker to, to be able to your, your, they absorb your volume, but then they start to dispatch it between different 3PLs and then you can benefit from that. It's like we, we are doing on our marketplace, right? When we're going to pick up the two our sellers, we take it, it's either Lex or Kerry picking up, but afterwards we spread the volume different, between different three PLs at, at the end. So then we, we are helping the sellers to improve the, the economics there. Cons is you have to respect the timing because a driver will come pick up at a certain time and you have to push all your orders by that time. So less independent than the first model, but then you're having some scale effect on transportation. Third one is 100 to 5,000. So 5,000 is debatable, it could be 1,000, 10,000, depending on the size of your item, depending on your business. This one is for sure the, the fulfillment can start to be tricky. Uh, it's better that you start to outsource it out of, your, uh, out of your home and you start to learn out of it. Still, it will, it will require a lot of investment if you want to do it in-house. You need to invest in the technology, in the training, which is, which is not that easy, and the investment may not um, be, uh, you may not have a big return on your investment if your size uh, stop at that, at that spot. The delivery part, you still, um, you still continue to outsource the delivery. 5,000 to uh, 100,000, this one for sure you should, you should really work and looking at how you can in-house in, in your fulfillment. Then you've got the size which really matter, which really makes sense to be able to make all your deliveries. Uh, to, to pack all your fulfillment. You can invest in conveyors, in automations, in order to faster your process, to gain, uh, to optimize your economics. For the delivery part, still not exactly the, the scale where you can make it for everywhere. You, you can start to do it, but it's, it will be more investment. And when you start to do in-house, it's million plus investment in the initial warehouse, in the technology, in the training you have to consider. For the last bucket is 100,000 plus orders, and I wish everybody could make it. 
is, is going to be uh, in, uh, in source bus fulfillment and delivery. This one you will decide to make a national one delivery by your own if you want to do. Um, but as well, it's, it's going to be tricky, right? Because every step in e-commerce is, is a different business, right? Transportation is very different problematics to handle than fulfillment part. For fulfillment, you've got all the products in one big warehouse, one place only. You can control and see all the people very easily, and they've got tasks which can be a lot controlled. There is no interface to the customers. When you go on the transportation part, you've got fleet of hundreds of thousands of riders and drivers across the country. You do not see them every day. It's far more difficult to control them. They are directly in front of the customer. They can discuss with them. They can say bad things, good things, and it's far more, far more difficult to control. So as well, it's just where do you want to go and what do you want to do? As, as a summary, there is no antagonism between the two. It depends where is your business risk, what is critical for your customer experience, just be sure that if you want to, uh, to, in to make it in-house, in in be sure that you are ready to invest, that you plan ahead to, to be able to make it successful, and that, that you are enabling as well and, and avoiding to have some blockers, like Amazon is having in, in, in Europe, etc. with all the three PRs. This one is a key decision for you to say, customer experience, I am sure I'm able to make it very good for the customer. And is it clearly a way for me to remove some business risk I have? Thank you. Thanks, Pedro. So, the panel. Um, it would be great, maybe um, Alex and Santit, whether you guys could just quickly introduce yourself and what you guys do, so we, the audience knows. Santit. Sure. Um, so I'm uh, the managing director of Lala Move Thailand. Um, Lala Move is an application on the mobile phone. You can access it through our web app as well on the uh, on the website. So basically, um, if you download our app, we can uh, you put in um, pick up, drop off location, and you can call our vehicle. Uh, we specialize in the first mile, last mile delivery. So um, in within the um, city area now, we're doing about 15 to 20 minutes uh, before the vehicle get to you. Um, we don't do, uh, I guess, warehousing. So when the vehicle goes to your pickup location, um, it, uh, the, the vehicle will drop off um, your, your parcel right away. So. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Alex from uh, Kerry Express. Uh, a little bit introduction of the Kerry Group. Uh, Kerry uh, is not very well known since two years ago, but indeed we have been in Thailand and ASEAN for 50 years. Uh, Kerry is one of the world's largest uh, sugar and edible oil company on earth. And we also own the Shangri-La Hotel Group and also the uh, Bangkok Post, South China Morning Post companies like that. Uh, our oil and grain company is, is called Wilma, formerly known as Kerry Oil and Grain. And Kerry Logistics was formed 20 years ago. Kerry Express was uh, in Thailand since 10 years ago. If I didn't tell you, might to know, Kerry Express uh, is the first express parcel delivery company in Thailand. And Today, uh, we are the biggest uh, parcel services company in Thailand, and we cover 99.9% .9 of the population by our next day services. So, and we are also the biggest uh, payment on delivery collector in Thailand. Uh, we collect billions of Thai baht every, every single month. And we serve B2B, B2C, and also C2C sectors. And starting uh, last year, we also went into the, the in-city messenger services. Uh, we, we call it Bangkok same day, and with 30 to 55 baht, we, we get things from one place to another within Bangkok. So Kerry Express, the headquarters, uh, is in Thailand, and we are also in Vietnam, uh, in Taiwan, in Hong Kong, Malaysia, Cambodia, and we are going to Myanmar, Indonesia, all these countries. Thank you very much. That's great. So I'm seeing the pain, the pain will go away in Indonesia. So um, <clears throat> yeah, just a question since you already started, Alex. It's like um, from the three phases, which, um, which I presented, or from the different one which we presented right now, um, do you see a same pattern in terms of your customers? Is it like very s a lot of small ones coming now to you? Is it like the, 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 sca the really the smart up ones, or is it really the super scalable ones? Or can you share a bit more? Uh, we indeed, we, we serve everybody. Um, if we are talking about e-commerce, e-commerce 
uh, customers' account for, I would guess, 20% of our total volume shipping every day. We're shipping 100 to 150,000 parcels in Thailand per day. E-commerce is around 20%. And uh, interestingly, we see a lot of customers growing from the startup stage until a scale up, uh, in, in your jargon, st scale up uh, big customers. One of the interesting customers we started uh, to serve three years ago uh, is Lazada. And we start from 10 shipments a day until we have tens of thousands. So, so we, we serve everybody and we are very, very uh, uh, willing and eager to grow everybody and grow the industry. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Santit, from, from your perspective, I, if you look at your existing client base, right, do you have the feeling it's moving more like into centralized models as uh, the, the volume goes up or do you see, still see like point to point? What's your experience right now? So for uh, Lala Move, yeah, we um, service uh, a lot of uh, small businesses. Um, we also service consumer. I mean, you can download our app and then uh, call vehicle, so it's very easy. Um, what, what I see though, like we, we, right now we deliver uh, uh, pretty much everything except illegal stuff. <laughs> so <laughs> um, so uh, every, when everything, I mean like, uh, um, you know, we deliver food, we deliver um, electronics, uh, we deliver apparel, we deliver um, like even durians, yeah. So, uh, uh, but what, what, I what forbidden <laughs> stuff. That's right, that's right. Um, it is uh, maybe a bit harder to deliver durian now. <laughs> but uh, um, I, I guess I want to give you an example of uh, um, for, for our customers. Yeah? Um, so we do a lot of food deliveries. Um, normally food deliveries, um, you can't really send it through mail, right? So mm -hmm. it has to always be uh, first mile, last mile delivery. Um, for food, yeah. So um, you know, like say, say, say the food price is uh, um, two hundred, three hundred baht, right? Um, it doesn't make sense for uh, um, you know the, the end customer to be uh, uh, paying maybe you know hundred baht, two hundred baht delivery costs. Um, normally, like the first mile, last mile is the most expensive because um, it, it, it's more customized delivery, right? So um, you know they, they tend to limit I think the um, the distance that the um, from the store um, and uh, how far they would deliver um, when they get to uh, a certain scale meaning that uh, um, they have a lot of volume yeah um, I see that they tend to open uh, different locations still limit the um, the, the, the distance uh, delivery distance but uh, open to a different locations so that uh, um, they can service more of their customer in key areas. So in that sense, uh, yeah, I think uh, um, as e-commerce grow, yeah, as uh, these, these uh, you know, our, our customer, our user grow, um, I think we'll see a lot more of that uh, in, in, in the future. In the future as well. Yeah. Okay, good. good. Um, Bertrand, it was very interesting when you showed actually the overview with your different um, orders per day. Is that exactly the way how you followed it um, the, um, at Lazada or is this more like the key learnings which you took out of it and this is more like from a future perspective? Uh, it's a bit both, right? So we are trying to, to align the way we do in, in Lazada with, with what we think about the market. So um, we've got a very different, different type of, of sellers, right? We've got thousands of sellers, and basically we've got very small ones, which are a long tail of sellers, which are more uh, family businesses, just shops starting on e-commerce, and, and we have big companies which are, and, or big retailers which are selling as well on, on the website, where the, their fulfillment part is very much different. And the growth is, is, is everywhere, right? It's just that the, the way they have to handle it and the issue they are having is a bit different. For example, during, uh, during last year, we had to help uh, some, some um, uh, sellers to be able to, to set up their organization in their own warehouses. They were, they were having difficulties to, order, uh, to, to process uh, 500 uh, orders a day. And then during the December part, they were able to handle uh, more than 20,000 items in over three days with no issues, right? But it's a kind of help where we are trying to teach the big sellers to be able to grow. On the same times, we are, tr we are having a lot of new sellers coming in where we have to teach them, hey, how do you do e-commerce, right? What do you have to put on the content website? Mm -hmm. Is there a lot of information to be for them to be successful, right? How do you have to pack your item? Because when a 3PL is going to take the parcel, it has to be correctly packed, otherwise product is going to be damaged at the end. And the medium time we start to have as well right now, we're working on this one, some medium-sized sellers, which are trying to grow, trying to improve. And where we are, actually last week and this week, we are testing to put ERP in some sellers where we are helping them to put the right system on, on their side, right? Connected with our system, but they can process the order, 
in a, in, in a better way, ensuring they've got their inventory part, they're able to do bundling, etc. So it's the kind of things where e-commerce is really growing and on all the different parts and we just how we have to help as well the different sellers to be able to grow. Good. Um, change of topics now. Costs. Um, so one, one thing which I'm wondering, um, Alex, is because in many or in all of the cases you have actually your own fleet. So can you tell us or the audience a bit more around um, what are the advantages and disadvantages actually of owning your own last mile? Uh, we own 100% of our last mile. Let's talk about the cons first. It's very, very expensive in terms of money and in terms of time. We have spent years in building up all this infrastructure and still growing 10 to 20% month to month. We are building tens of offices every, every single month and it's very, very uh, hard work to, to build all this and we spent a lot of effort and, and time on, on this and not to mention a lot of money on that. So mm -hmm. I think that that is the biggest drawback and that is the biggest uh, cons. But uh, I think to, to lead the market, you need to have your own last mile capability mm -hmm. because uh, company, last mile delivery companies, if you don't, don't have your own last mile, so, so what are you doing over here? So of mm -hmm. course we have some outsource uh, resources, but, but the whole system and the whole protocol mm -hmm. of doing delivery, last mile delivery is all mm -hmm. owned and managed by, by our own selves. So mm -hmm. I, I, I don't think it's a con, but it's must okay. in doing so. Yeah. And you sent it basically is completely different direction, right? It's, it's mean, a very, very completely, yeah, that's right. right. So um, for Lala Move, yeah, uh, we own zero assets. Um, we don't have any drivers on payroll. We don't own any vehicles. Yeah. So <laughs> is, I mean, I, I very much respect what Kerry does, um, but, uh, um, but I would argue that, uh, um, you know, if you look at the, the service level that Lala Move is doing, yeah, and basically, uh, essentially, Lala Move is a platform that connects uh, drivers and users. Yeah? Um, at the same time, it's more than that. Um, we also provide uh, customer service that actually solve problem rather than just you know answering questions. Yeah? Our driver uh, operation team uh, do more than just onboarding drivers. Yeah? Um, the, the the service level uh, that I talk about it's uh, fulfillment. Yeah? Uh, so I think this is one of the key uh, 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 matrix that we look at. Um, we actually been doing almost perfect, yeah. Um, and when I say almost perfect, it's about 99 percent, yeah. So how 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 do you do that, right? How how do you provide the service quality? Um, it it it's just uh, I guess the policies that uh, um, you look at the I mean you put down for the drivers, yeah. Um, like uh, different rules, yeah. Um, it it is really th there's really no precedent of uh, um, how uh, uh, this type of uh, model yeah works yeah so we are also experimenting I'm not claiming that you know we know everything uh, but at the same time you know over the past year uh, I've been uh, quite pleased with the the performance uh, of of our service. Okay. Is the um, uh, another question is the AEC um, the whole thing which is going on right now is it like for you providing new markets to tap into? Are you planning, are you have any plans to roll out your um, uh, tech basically by the end of the day into other big metropoles which you want to use there? Or what's, what's your strategy in terms of um, everything what happens with AEC in the background? So I think uh, when I think about AEC, I think about competition, yeah. Um, I think about uh, other markets, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I guess the, the, there are two, uh, I guess, uh, factors. So. Um, for for uh, a model like Lala Move to work, yeah, um, we have we have to look at um, the supply situation in in different cities, right? So um, if there's not enough uh, independent driver, um, meaning that you know the driver who own their own vehicle um, and can provide the service, right? Um, it's probably not the best market for Lala Move to to get into. Yeah. Uh, in terms of competition, um, like uh, uh, you know, even without AEC, the, there's so many, you know. <laughs> so, um, you know, I, I don't really uh, worry that AEC is here because you can see that, like, um, you know, at least uh, uh, local players, international players, yeah, are already here even before AEC. Okay. And Alex, for you, I mean, because you are directly there and, and seeing it on a daily basis. Do you see with the DAC that you will have more and more cross-border shipments, people like centralizing, sending stuff over, or do you think it will not have such a huge implication on your business? I think it will happen, but I can't tell how long will it take. So, um, Kerry is a very, very realistic company, so mm -hmm. we follow the 80-20 rule. We, we spend 
I think 95% of our resources in making our last mile delivery better. Mm -hmm. And 5 to 10% of our resources, we, are, we have been pioneering the cross-border solutions. We've been the, one of the first companies doing cross-border transportation in, uh, in the region, but that accounts for 5 to 10% of our total resources. Uh, we are not extremely superstitious towards the AEC because uh, we believe a business depending on policy is not a good business. Okay. Interesting, okay. Bertrand, from your side, does it change in any ways how you guys do business in terms of what are the interesting markets you want to go next into or does it have any implication at all, the whole AEC development? So we'll have to see when. We'll have to see when, uh, when we can have the AEC open, right? So. If I if I use what I what I used to have in Amazon, where we're in Europe and you've got the Schengen, uh, the Schengen world, right? So in Europe, it's very easy. You can fulfill any order for any customer from any warehouse in Europe. We were doing um, optimization of fulfillment placement by looking at where is the density of the customer which is go which are going to order this product, and we were doing transshipment between warehouses from Germany back to France, sometimes Italy and Spain, to be able to, to, um, to shorten the as, as much as possible the last mile delivery as well, because this is the most costly part in, in the world e-commerce part. So would we have AEC? Would be great, because it will open new markets, new customers. And uh, we can see when we discuss with people which are outside Thailand willing to get uh, products from, um, from Thailand will be, will be very good, or from other uh, countries of all. But as well, it will be a fantastic way to be able to improve and optimize the logistics overall by moving products in the region and to be able to optimize the cost faster the delivery as well and, uh, yeah, and, optimize and reducing the cost. So if I understand you guys correctly, it's really like we have to wait and see what comes out of it, right, and what kind of implication it has. Um, from the last point, which I wanted to just uh, quickly discuss is around um, innovation. So especially, I mean, uh, Bertrand, if you look at your volume, which is increasing, yeah, happily, and um, what are the things or what are the trends, what you see, or also what does it mean to your business in terms of innovation, in terms of automation, for instance? Is there a lot of things you're focusing on right now? Yeah, so, so automation is a part, right? The more the volumes goes up, you say, hey, why do I have people pushing parcels, right? Why not the parcel can move by itself in the warehouse, right? So, mm -hmm. so automation in there, right? When you have to sort parcel between a lot of different 3 pls so where you're working with 3 pls say, hey, instead of sending your product directly to your sort center, but I've got evo e enough volume to put a full truck from my warehouse directly to your hub in Chiang Mai, then you start to, to start to split your volume differently. You need more and more sorting, right? And which means sorting either is manual work, which is true, as you said before, shipping and uh, are not that expensive in Southeast Asia, but still it's, it's a lot of cost. And where you can put automation, which costs one, two millions, but at the end, overall, with all the parcels you're doing, you're saving costs, you're having less human errors, and, uh, and you can be, right, it works faster, etc. So automation is uh, something we are looking deeply into. Okay. Interesting. Um, Santit, especially around <coughs> innovative technology, I mean, that's what you guys are, um, uh, are implemented, what you have implemented right today. Do you see yourself as like you're disrupting the traditional 3PL um, industry? Or is that for you a different play? How do you see yourselves? Um, I, I think the disrupting um, the 3PL companies is uh, probably not the right way to say it. I, I would say that the disrupting the industry more. Uh, before uh, Lala Move came in Thailand, yeah, um, the fastest that you can get your vehicle is probably three hours. You know? um, and this is the same first mile, last mile delivery. Um, so in that sense, like uh, um, traditionally, uh, uh, like the the 3PL company like to focus more on B2B because it, uh, it is it's probably easier and probably you can make the most margin there. Um, as now that the e-commerce becoming more uh, uh, prevalent, yeah. So um, you know they they also moving into a, a, a B2C, yeah. Um, and in that sense, like, uh, um, you know, I even now, like, if, if um, you order a vehicle for uh, 3PL, yeah, um, you might have a schedule pickup time, schedule drop off time, yeah. Um, the beauty of, um, I guess, Lana Move model is, uh, you know, like, there you can scale uh, so much faster. Uh, but at the same time, there are drawbacks too. Um, how do you control the drivers, right? So. Um, I, I think that uh, uh, in the end, it, it, it's it's better for the consumer because there are choices. Yeah, um, you know, 3PL and us, we also work together sometimes too. So, 
Um, I see a four of a collaborative uh, environment uh, disrupting the industry and uh, uh, better for the consumer. Uh, I think in the end, consumer, um, they're looking for, the trend is definitely faster and cheaper delivery, right? So, okay. Final question then to Alex. Um, in terms of innovation, what do you see? Can we see the first drones taking off soon in Thailand or what's the next big thing for you guys? Um, innovation in, in my team uh, doesn't mean technology. It's a new way of doing things. So uh, something is interesting to share about innovation is the inner management of, of my company. Uh, starting last year, we didn't have regular meeting. We don't have regular reports. We don't have regular sit down with the team. We just have small groups and we don't have hierarchy or all this stuff. So this is internal innovation of the uh, way of doing things. And looking forward, uh, I think one big thing to come in the industry, uh, e-commerce and also delivery will be on payment. Uh, I think t this year or latest next, uh, we will have a big, uh, uh, big thing coming up. We can see in the market that uh, not to say to replace COD, but a new option, new good choice for, for the market. And I, I will bet, I will bet a lot on, on this new payment solutions in, in Thailand. We are still very backward in, in that compared to ch even China, compared to, to the States. So I will bet on that in terms of technology. Okay. Great. Thanks a lot, guys. Thanks a lot for the discussion. Enjoyed it. Um, the guys are all around here. You'll stay for the drinks, obviously, right? So if you have any question in terms of scaling, you have the right people here. In terms of um, outsourcing your transportation, feel free just to go to the guys and ask questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.